to the book of Acts, chapter 15. The book of Acts, chapter 15. We are into the, what you might call the second half of the book of Acts. And this morning we are in a very significant chapter, a chapter that changed the course, really, of uh, doctrine in the church, or defined it at least, and defined it permanently, because this is God's Word. We're going to look through most of the chapter this morning. It's a, a council, you may see in your Bible there, it's called the Jerusalem Council. In my Bible, it's how it's, the heading is. It's a, it's a gathering, so it's not a church planting journey, but there is a journey to guarantee a certain theological clarity for the church. That's what Acts 15 is, is all about. I'm going to read it in, in sections and comment on it as I go, and then we're going to have the latter part of the message be application for us. But before I do that, I wanted to read some words that are not biblical words or of Scripture, but they are valuable because they changed my life when I was about 13 years old. Uh, some of you may have read these words too, from a book called Transforming Grace by Jerry Bridges. When I was about 13, I read this. Now, you may have never thought of it this way, but you are bankrupt. I'm not referring to your financial condition or your moral qualities. You may be financially as solid as the rock of Gibraltar and the most upstanding person in your community, but you are still bankrupt. So am I. But what kind of bankruptcy did we declare? In the business world, financially troubled companies forced into bankruptcy have two options, popularly known as Chapter 7 and Chapter 11, after the respective chapters in the Federal Bankruptcy Code. Chapter 11 deals with what we could call temporary bankruptcy. This option is chosen by a basically healthy company that, given time, can work through its financial problems. Chapter 7. Chapter 7 is for a company that has reached the end of its financial rope. It is not only deeply in debt, it has no future as a viable business. It is forced to liquidate its assets and pay off its creditors, often by as little as 10 cents on the dollar. The company is finished. It's all over. The owners or investors lose everything they've put into the business. No one likes Chapter 7 bankruptcy. So, what kind of bankruptcy did we declare? Now, when I was 13 years old, that paragraph floored me. It undid me. Because Bridges goes on to talk about how most Christians functionally declare a sort of temporary bankruptcy. They, they know they need help. They, they need to get into a place of right standing with God. But that is, is sort of a temporary need that then they add to their righteousness or their effort or their hard-working moralism as a Christian to get themselves back into a good place. So they need sort of a hand up but then they work out the remainder of their salvation and their preservation ultimately is left up to their efforts. And I realized that Bridges had me nailed. I realized I, I'm not sure I understood that the gospel means I am permanently incapable of saving myself. I'm not sure I have believed that that way to that degree. I am permanently bankrupt in myself, permanently incapable of saving myself, and my little 13-year-old legalistic, moralistic, nice church kid had never heard of such a thing. It floored me, and then it set me free. And I believe that's the effect of Acts chapter 15. It floors us, and then it sets us free. Let's read through it. I'm going to read through it in four sections. I'll comment as we go. And then, as I said, we'll look into some application for us. Acts chapter 15, verse 1. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers... 
Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. So this first section, we might caption the demand. There's a demand made by certain Judean believers who come down to Antioch, where Paul and Barnabas have returned, and they begin to teach that there must be circumcision for these Gentile converts to truly be saved, to truly be converted. It requires circumcision, and not just circumcision. You notice there at the end of verse 5, it says that that's just the doorway into the entire keeping of the law of Moses. So you want to notice the way Luke frames this opening paragraph. There's this demand at the beginning, and then Paul and Barnabas debate them. They disagree with this demand, and then they go up to Jerusalem to talk to Peter and James and the other apostles and elders because this is such a crucial question. They want to gather a council of elders and apostles together, and they're communicating to the churches the joyful news that Gentiles have been converted. And then we see at the end of the chapter, the same believers apparently rise up and declare it is necessary again for them to keep the whole law of Moses. And you get a little bit of a a premonition of what Luke's perspective is about this. There's this demand, then there's this joyful recounting of the expansion of the gospel, and then the command again. So you get an, an impression of where Luke is going. Luke considers this demand to be an interruption to the joyful progress of the gospel that has been taking place. He almost frames it as this annoying interruption to what otherwise would be a joyful celebration. But this demand is so real and the debate is so profound that they decide to go to Jerusalem and to have a once and for all decision on this matter. Paul and Barnabas discern this issue is fundamental to the nature of what God is doing in the world. It must be settled, and it must be settled not just by us, but in a unified way by the founding witnesses of the gospel. we got to get up there and talk to Peter and James and the other apostles. This has to be a all-of-us-together decision that's made. So let's go. Barnabas, we are go. We are going up there, and we're going to talk to those brothers about this demand that the keeping of the full law of Moses is necessary for salvation. All right, let's keep reading. In verse 6, the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, brothers, You know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. And all the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree. Just as it is written, After this I will return, and I will build the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins. I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. 
Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. I caption this section, the debate. So Paul and Barnabas hear this demand of these Judean brothers that have come down from Jerusalem. They disagree with them, and then they travel up to Jerusalem. They gather all the apostles and elders together, and they have a debate. And it says where there had been much debate. So apparently they have been arguing back and forth these Jewish Christians who believe, probably genuinely, that these Gentile converts must still keep the law of Moses. So they, they, they believe apparently that Jesus is the Messiah, but that the law of Moses is still in effect to be followed in full. This is these Jewish believers, and I, I would suspect many of them are genuine in that. Well, well I, I believe Jesus is the Messiah, but that does not do away with the keeping of the ceremonial aspects of the law of Moses. They must still be fulfilled. So they debate. And you can feel the drama of this. Then Peter stands up. So whether he's been listening quietly to this point or not, we don't know. But apparently this is a definitive moment. Peter, the rock, the one who was chosen to be the initial leader of the apostles, he stands before the assembly as a Jew and makes this speech declaring that the argument in favor of viewing the Gentiles as already full members exclusively through the faith of Jesus has been settled ultimately by God. That's the effect of his argument. So he stands up and he makes a couple of points. We'll we'll just look at them generally. He's saying, look, brothers, we already know that God made a choice. You notice that down there. Uh, look, look down there in verse 7. God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So he's reminding them when he went down to Cornelius and he preached. And he's saying, look, you guys know that was a sovereignly worked event. I had a vision about clean animals. Just then, the brothers came and appealed that I would come to Cornelius' house. And simultaneously, this happened. And then I went to Cornelius' house. I preached, and the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. And he's, he's making this point. He's saying, look, God knows their heart. So you brothers are saying, we don't know if they're actually converted fully yet. Peter says, we do know because God knows their heart and he bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit. He's saying, brothers, if God gave the Holy Spirit the thing that no former Israelite ever experienced, the manifest indwelling presence of God, no former Israelite, no matter what they did with the law of Moses, ever experienced the indwelling presence of God. And God gave that to these Gentiles. God gave himself to these Gentiles. He's saying, look, you're, God himself stood on the witness stand, as it were, and declared genuine conversion. So so Peter is essentially saying, you're disagreeing with God. God declared them to be fully, and he knows their heart. He knows, he cleansed, it says in verse 9, their hearts. How? By faith. So apparently they did not need the cleansing effect of the law of Moses because God cleansed their hearts. Remember the law of Moses, clean and unclean, big deal. Distinction between Jew and Gentile to be clean and unclean. The Gentiles were unclean. The Jews were clean. And, and Peter's saying, well, God apparently cleansed their hearts because he put himself inside of them. And then he goes further. He's saying, brothers, not only are you wrong, You are opposing God. You are, he says, putting God to the test. You're placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. He's making the point, look, let's look at our history and remember, we have never been able to keep faithfully the law of Moses. And you are opposing God and asking them to do something that God has not asked them to do. And notice the humility in verse 11. We believe that who will be saved? We will be saved, how? Through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they 
they will. I think it's very intentional that Peter says, look, let me tell you how I'm going to get saved. I'm going to get saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. Uh, me, a Jew, I, I, I am saved. How? By the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. So even I am no longer going to be saved by the keeping of the law of Moses. Me, me, brother, me, Peter, I, I will not be saved that way. I will be saved. My hope, my confidence, my justification, my righteousness is exclusively based on what God has done in Christ by grace. And that's the same means of salvation for every Gentile convert that I've seen converted over these last years. Brothers, he says, you are opposing God. You are just like those Israelites in the wilderness who wanted to go back to Egypt. Did God lead them to Egypt in the first place? Yes, he did during the time of Joseph. But should they go back? Absolutely not. You are putting God to the test, brothers. Now that quiets them, thankfully. They fall silent, and then they listen to Paul and Barnabas, who essentially make a similar point just from personal testimony. That what are they doing? They're relating. God has, inescapably, the evidence is present. God has done signs and wonders, verse 12, through Paul and Barnabas to the Gentiles. So Paul and Barnabas add their voice saying, brothers, it's God has evidently been on the move in these church planting journeys. So clearly, God is for this mission, which has not included the requirement of keeping the full law of Moses. Then James stands up. This is James, the brother of the Lord, who was very significant. He stands up and he says, brothers, apparently a leader in the assembly, responsible to give this kind of final argument. He says, brothers, Simeon has related how God, notice, notice the accent, God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. So then he's going to add to the argument. Not only has God borne witness in time through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the purifying of their hearts, the signs and wonders, but this was what he promised he would do from history and from the word. So he takes this quote from Amos and he says, God promised that he would return to his people. He would rebuild the tent of David, which was devastated in, in all of the sin that followed Solomon. I would rebuild it, he says, and the remnant of mankind will seek the Lord. And brothers, remember verse 17. He's preaching. James gets up and he starts preaching to the assembly. He says, brothers, the Gentiles who are called by my name, they also will be brought in to the people of God. So God always intended to bring in Gentiles called by the name of the Lord. So when the great house of David was rebuilt by the return of the Lord to his people, the Gentiles who are called by the name of the Lord would be brought in. This was God's intention. And since God has, has clearly blessed and honored the preaching of the gospel and not the preaching of the law of Moses, we must acknowledge that God has done something new and definitive and irrevocable that cannot be retreated from, that cannot be resisted. God promised to bring in Gentiles into his family. So there is a new family of God, a new remnant of mankind that are called by the name of the Lord. What a debate that must have been. Imagine this moment. There's debate, 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 all these people. We got to have them keep this isn't right. And then, bam, Peter stands up. You remember, brothers, what happened when I went to Cornelius' house. And then Paul and Barnabas, let me tell you what God has done to give evidence to the preaching of the name of Jesus Christ. And then finally, James stands up and says, brothers, this was always God's plan. Apparently, the debate was ended at that point. Those with those demands were silenced. They had been proven wrong by the testimony of God's current action and God's historic promise. So then James gives his judgment, which is then repeated in the letter that they write to be sent to the Gentile believers. Let's read that letter. This is what we might call the decision. The final decision is encompassed in this letter in verse 22. It seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas called Barsabbas and Silas, leading men from among the brothers with the following letter. 
the brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions, it has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth, For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. Now, (laughs) there's a lot we could look at in this letter, this decision that they make. But... I want to say what, what always strikes me initially, and I assume there's questions for you, is, okay, why, why do they bring it? They don't seem to address circumcision, but then they do address strangling and blood. So if you've ever read this, if you've ever experienced, I've experienced that. This, you don't seem to be answering their question, and then you're, you're bringing up things that they didn't bring up. Um, how is this letter helpful? Um, did somebody else, after the decision was made, get in and say, well, can we just include this one more paragraph uh, <laughs> and insert that as a technicality at the end? No, I don't think that's the case. I think we are uh, in, a, in a default position because we're not there. We're not hearing it in the way they would have heard it. Actually, when the letter is read to the Gentile churches, I'll make this point later, there's great joy. So for them, this was an abundantly clear response. Abundantly clear. Here's here's the essence of what is taking place in this letter. As David Peterson writes, James submits two proposals. The first is a formal rejection of the demand of the Judaizers, and the second is a way for Gentiles to take account of Jewish concerns without compromising their freedom from the Mosaic law. So this seems to be the right way to understand this. Because we are, uh, we tend to think, well, it's, 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 um, I don't want to, what's the strangling with blood thing? I don't understand that. And idolatry, I don't deal with that. It's confusing to us. It would not have been confusing to them. And here's why. You were either going to keep the law of Moses or you weren't. That was the question. You're either going to keep the law of Moses as represented by circumcision and all of the civil and ceremonial structures of the law of Moses, or you weren't. On that point, James and the brothers are explicitly clear. They distanced themselves emphatically from the Judaizers who had come down from Jerusalem, and they say, we will not lay this burden on you. We do not think, and you notice he says, it's good to the Holy Spirit. We don't think the Holy Spirit wants you to be required to keep the law of Moses. So it is emphatic We will not lay on the burden of these believers the responsibility to keep the law, including circumcision and all the other laws that go along with that. That being said, we do expect the Gentile believers to continue in holiness before God and to be sensitive to the consciences and offenses that could be occurring with the Jews that are around them. I think that's the point when when he says there are, you notice there in verse 21, from ancient generations Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. So these categories... Uh, abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from what has been strangled, and from blood, are motivated, apparently, by the presence of Jews in every city where the gospel has been preached. So I think the best way to understand this is they're basically making two points. The law of Moses was not to be kept as a requirement of salvation. They will not say, and if you're not going to be circumcised, there is no way you are keeping the law of Moses. So that, that point is what we maybe don't appreciate is so emphatically clear about this letter. If they don't require circumcision, then there is no keeping of the law of Moses because you cannot be a Jewish proselyte unless you do that. There is no keeping of the law of Moses as a legal requirement for salvation. 
The law of Moses was not to be kept as a requirement of salvation. By rejecting the argument that circumcision and ceremonial law keeping be required, they were declaring for all time that the law of Moses was not the means of covenant with God for God's people after Jesus. Secondly, they are deeply concerned about the unity, godliness, and testimony of God's people. So they call the Gentiles away from things that would be particularly tempting to their own souls or offensive to the Jews in their community. And the list of behaviors that are forbidden fits in those categories. Idolatry and sexual immorality would continue to be wrong for believers in Jesus. The eating of blood and things strangled would either involve them in idolatry or they would cause their witness to be offensive to those Jews in their communities. And that seems to be the point that James is making. As it relates to legalism, the letter defends salvation by grace alone. As it relates to holiness and their testimony, the letter defends godliness and a loving and sensitive lifestyle. You can appreciate the wisdom of these elders when they gather together. David Peterson summarizes, The Jerusalem Council acknowledged that Gentile Christians were not obligated to live under the yoke of the law. At the same time, it challenged them to exercise their liberty with wisdom, restraint, and love. This seems to be the summary of this letter. This is the effect that it had. This leads into the final section, the declaration. We read in verse 30, So when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. So these two brothers from Jerusalem go just so it can be absolutely validated. These are accredited leaders from Jerusalem. And the result of this letter with its twofold message, no keeping of the law of Moses for salvation, but holiness and sensitivity in your communities brings great joy to Antioch and encouragement and to the other churches where the letter is read. So the declaration, result of this declaration is joy. Now, how do we apply this to us? We must defend the grace of God from the lie of legalism. Now, there's a lot of great points you can make in this passage about the value of a plurality of pastors and discussion, and people make those points, trust me. But I think the main point of this chapter is not about how do you lead a council meeting or how do you discuss things reasonably. I don't think that's the main point. I think the main point is, the main point is we must defend the grace of God from the lie of legalism, and we must do it in the way the Bible does it. We must defend it in our own hearts. We must defend it in our communities. We must defend it in the way we represent the message. We must defend it in in countless ways, but I'm going to give four ways. Four ways that we defend the grace of God from the lie of legalism. First, we defend God's grace in how we read the Bible, especially the Old Testament. We defend the grace of God in how we read or interpret the Bible, especially the Old Testament. Acts 15 is abundantly clear. We are not to obey the Old Testament Mosaic Covenant as our way of salvation. We are not to obey the Old Testament Mosaic Covenant as our way of salvation. Now, this is not to say that repeating any Old Testament practice is automatically sinful in and of itself. For example, we're going to read in the very next paragraph that Paul has his young protege Timothy circumcised to avoid giving unnecessary offense to Jews. So it wouldn't be wrong to do that. The question is, why are you doing that? And are you requiring that of others? It's not to say that repeating any Old Testament practice is automatically sinful in and of itself. Christians might also try to have a Passover meal as a way of remembering that part of the biblical story. But no Old Testament ceremonial law is to be obeyed or required of others as the source of our salvation. 
We do not relate to the law in the same way that they did before the coming of Christ. And we can go further than that. To relate to the law as if it is unchanged by the coming of Christ is to put ourselves in opposition to God's purposes in this era of salvation. We might think of the idea that God has given Christians Christ lenses in the reading of the Bible, and especially the Old Testament. They are to be viewed as fulfilled and transformed by the coming of Jesus Christ. And Christians do not have the right, actually they are in danger if they do, attempt to take off those lenses and read those Old Testament scriptures as it were, as if Christ had never come. That's the, almost the entire point of the book of Hebrews. Don't try to read the Old Testament scriptures as if Christ had never come. Now, they still have ongoing validity for us, ongoing authority even for us, but interpreted through the coming of Jesus Christ. So all of the Old Testament teaching is still God's word, but it must be interpreted for us on this side of Jesus. So we do not offer sacrifices for salvation, no, but we do believe in the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We do not rebuild a temple to embody God's holiness, but we do live lives that, that showcase that we are now the temple of the Holy Spirit through the union that we have with Jesus Christ. We do not uh, raise up festivals to remember the Old Testament means of salvation, but we do celebrate on a weekly basis the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the gospel message. We, we, we are not free. <laughs> so in an anti-legalism message, it's, it's odd to say this, but it's true. We are not free to read the Old Testament as if Christ did not come. There has been a recent move in some corners of the church, not our church, I'm just saying the church, Big C, to focus on certain elements of the Old Testament ceremonial practices and to recommend them or even require them of Christians. I want to urge extreme caution in this kind of teaching. I'm absolutely in favor. I love the Old Testament. In favor of studying the Old Testament, teaching it to our children, but not as an end in itself, but as a picture that has been fulfilled in Christ. We must not glorify the Old Testament practices and we must not subtly act like those practices give us a higher spirituality as Christians. They do not. Walking through Old Testament festivals and practices do not give a Christian a higher spirituality than reviewing and remembering the union we have with Jesus Christ and the indwelling Holy Spirit. It is a new day. Christ is the end of the law for those that have believed. Acts 15 was emphatic in declaring that the burden of law keeping must not be required of New Testament saints. How we read the Bible. One way we defend the gospel of grace. Second way, how we relate to God. How we relate to God. Now, I don't know that many of us would assume that Old Testament law-keeping makes us more righteous, uh, but we often substitute our own version of law-keeping and our own sin management to make us more righteous before God. So how we relate to God is a crucial way that we defend the gospel of grace. It is not our law-keeping that gives us access to the presence of God. It is not our law-keeping Whatever the law is, whether it's the Mosaic law or the man-made sin management law that we've created in our own uh, creativity, that gives us access to God. If the Mosaic law was rejected as the source of access to God, then certainly our own self-made program of sin management is not the source of that access either. This is something incredibly humbling. This is what floored me about that passage from Jerry Bridges. My righteousness doesn't bring me closer to God. God didn't get me close and then leave me to keep my place there by my own efforts. 
It is once and for all the finished work of Jesus Christ, the indwelling Holy Spirit that brings believers permanently into the presence of God, adopted and cherished and loved, so that my righteousness before God is never decreased by my obedience. It's never increased by my victory in the Christian life. I am there before God exclusively because of what Christ has done, which I receive by faith. Now, there's something in our pride, in our soul, that leans towards law-keeping as the basis of our relationship with God. We have an inner legalist that is always desperate to move us in that direction. That inner legalist, I mean, he is sneaky, tricky, and consistent. He wants us to view our efforts as earning us a place with God or keeping us there. And he is determined to get us back into that mode of relationship with God because it just feels better to our pride. And it is humbling to stand before God and say, I will never, ever be worthy of being here. But it's freeing because I don't have to be. A few quotes from one of my heroes, again, Jerry Bridges. We are all legalistic by nature. That is, we innately think so much performance by us earns so much blessing from God. Most of us probably entertain either of these attitudes on different days. On a good day, as we perceive it, we tend towards self-righteous Phariseeism. On a not-so-good day, we allow ourselves to wallow in a sense of failure and guilt. Either way, we've moved away from the gospel of God's grace, trying to relate to God directly on the basis of our performance rather than through Christ. You can feel the, the nervousness of these Judaizing brothers. You can have, but brothers, if, if, if they go with just what you're preaching, it's almost as though they could just approach God without any ritualistic sacrifices at all. They couldn't. They can, they're not even circumcised. They can't even approach God using the law of Moses. And Paul and Barnabas say, yes, you have nailed it. That is exactly what they can do. Well, brothers, if we do that, then anybody who believes in Jesus could just assume they can approach God at any time and they're right with God at any moment. Yes. That's exactly what we're preaching to them because that's what God decided to do. The realization that my daily relationship with God, listen to this, is based on the infinite merit of Christ instead of on my own performance is a very freeing and joyous experience. But it is not meant to be a one-time experience. The truth needs to be reaffirmed daily. And don't we feel the need of that? Because on Tuesday morning, after you heard a message on Acts 15 and the grace of God, your inner legalist is going to be bantering you for attention. Try harder today. It'll make you feel better for how you didn't do good yesterday. <laughs> you yelled at the four-year-old yesterday, but today you can be encouraging. You looked in that wrong place yesterday, but today you can look with purity. You were impatient and anxious yesterday, but today you can have peace and trust God. You haven't read the Bible this last month, but next month you're going to read the whole Old Testament twice. <laughs> the inner legalist, he just raised up. Wouldn't it feel better if you could just make up for what you did in the past with what you do in the future? Wouldn't you feel better about that? What do you do right then? You defend grace. You shout down that inner legalist and the anti-God nonsense that he is proclaiming. And you say, you're right. You're right. I proved again yesterday how unworthy I am of approaching God today, but I will not substitute my day for my Savior. I will approach God based on Jesus 
today. And when I've had a great day, and that interlegalist says, well done, good day, well done. Now you can have a great time with God tomorrow or sing more loudly at church this week. You say, no, no, I refuse and reject my day in the past as the basis of my approach to God. It is only based on the unearned grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and on his atoning blood on my behalf. And that is the only reason I can sing boldly. And I can sing just as boldly on a great week Sunday and on a bad week Sunday. And I can approach God just as boldly on a terrible mothering day and on a great mothering day. On a day when I was patient and a day when I was angry. On a day when I was lustful and a day when I was pure. I can approach God with the same boldness because it is never based on me. How we relate to God, we must defend the gospel of grace. Third thing, I'll do these last two quickly. How do we relate to godliness? How do we relate to godliness? There is no contradiction between freedom in grace and our calling to godliness. There is no contradiction. James has no problem, and neither do the elders and all of our founding fathers. Here they are. No problem. Do not give in to sexual immorality. The law does not save you. No problem. They say both of those things. It doesn't bother them at all. No problem. Do not give in to idolatry and ungodly behavior. The law does not save you. And I think in their wisdom, they defend grace from a a wrong view of legalism that would, would, would basically go beyond law as a means of salvation and say any kind of calling is automatically inappropriate for the Christian. And they defend it, and you know in your life, and I know in my life, how easy it is where there has been that kind of preaching on grace that basically says what grace means is God couldn't care less what you do. Well, what's going to happen? In another generation, the church is going to swing towards legalism because that's not the biblical gospel either. God does care what you do. He just doesn't base his access for you on what you do. Of course, God wants you to love him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but that's just not the basis of your access with him. Of course, God didn't want the Corinthian Christians to be worshiping idols and committing sexual immorality. But their holiness was not the basis of their relationship with him. So we relate to godliness not by equating it with our salvation, nor by acting as though any reference to our calling to holiness is automatically legalism. There can be a kind of anti-legalism legalism that feels the need anytime godliness is referenced, to play a legalism card. Well, you know, the Bible says we shouldn't worship idols. Legalist! I am free in Jesus to worship whatever idols I want. I don't, that's not how the Bible talks. I don't think you should be committing immorality. Legalist! I am free in Jesus to do whatever I want. I don't think that's defending grace. I think it's obscuring what the Bible teaches. Here's the great chapter The great chapter in Acts on legalism includes the calling to holiness with no contradiction. The book of Galatians, the great book that denounces legalism, includes that we're to walk by the Spirit and not give in to the desires of the flesh. So we can view godliness not as an equation for salvation, and neither is something that God's ashamed of that he's called us to. So don't be the anti-legalist legalist. The only thing I'm bound to is calling out any kind of command as legalism. I'm bound to do that wherever I see it. No, that's not not what the scriptures do. Are you called to holiness? Yes, we are. Does that save us? No, it doesn't. If you're more holy, are you closer to God in your standing and your access to him? No, you're not. If you've just failed miserably for the millionth time, Are you cut off from claiming Jesus as your Savior and approaching him again? No, you're not. You can approach him again. How we relate to godliness. Finally, quickly, how do we relate to each other? I think it's helpful to appreciate that this is a 
<laughs> Judaizers were talking to the Gentiles about how they were supposed to act, and then the Jewish church <laughs> corrected that disposition and told them, Here, you may not, they may not tell you what God has not told you. We may not require of others the continued obedience to Old Testament laws that are fulfilled in Christ. Now, that should be an obvious point, but it's worth saying. We may not require of others the continued obedience to Old Testament laws that are fulfilled in Christ, or probably even worse, self-made expectations that are not even present in the Scriptures. What's worse, calling someone to obey an Old Testament law that was fulfilled in Christ, or making up your own law and telling other people they have to obey that to be good with God? At least God wrote those laws at one point. So no, we are not allowed to call people to things that are not present in the scripture. This requires constant vigilance to defend grace because we all have wise practices that are not necessarily scriptural, but they have really helped us to obey God. And what we do is we begin to equate our wise application with the authority of God's word. And we must not do that. We equate something that has really helped us genuinely to obey God. We equate that with the authority of God's word. This happens with <laughs> how early do you get up in the morning? What kind of school preference do you have for your children? What's your particular disciplinary practice for your children? How do you relate to your spouse on date night? How often do you have date night? Wonderful, wise practices that have helped us in obeying God that we can equate with scriptural authority. I think that's worse legalism than going back to the law of Moses because God didn't even say those things. We do this with movie choices. It does not mean there's not a call to godliness and we don't exhort one another on holiness and loving God and turning away from idols. But we have to be very careful that we're not equating legitimate calls to biblical obedience with the spreading of our particular preference or practice and how those principles are applied. Just as these believers were at the same time freed from legalism, also exhorted to live sacrificially for the sake of their Jewish neighbors. So here's this other point about how we relate to others. Notice that these Gentile believers, though they are free from the restraints of the law, they are exhorted to observe in their freedom certain practices so they're not offensive to others. Did you notice that? The, the, the blood thing, the strangled thing, that's a law of Moses thing. But they're calling them to observe those seemingly not to keep the law of Moses because that's already broken. There'd be no point in staying away from blood if you're not circumcised. It's pointless from a Jewish background. So the point has to be, don't do this not because you're not free to do it, but because it could be particularly offensive to those whose consciences are still bind, bound by that law, whether they're Jewish Christians who haven't understood their freedom or they're non-believer Jews who are offended by this kind of blood eating because it's restricted in the law of Moses. So the liberty that they are called to is a liberty that leads them to self-sacrifice, not belligerent demand that what they should be allowed to do is whatever they want. I love this quote by Martin Luther in his book On Christian Liberty. He says this, fight vigorously against the wolves, <laughs> but on behalf of the sheep, not against the sheep. And this you may do by inveighing against the laws and the lawgivers. I think he's talking about legalism there inveighing against the laws and the lawgivers, and yet at the same time, listen to this, observing these laws with the weak, lest they be offended until they shall themselves recognize the tyranny and understand their own liberty. What a wise quote. Well, sure, if someone demands that you can't be saved unless you do a certain unbiblical thing, you can stand against that in your freedom of Christ. But if you're with someone who considers that thing to be required of them, well, don't brazenly display your liberty in front of them. Be gentle with them. As he said to the Gentile believers, don't, don't, don't be eating strangled blood next to your Jewish synagogue brothers. That's going to be tempting to them. They're going to they're look down on the gospel and your witness. Now, are you free to do it? Sure, but don't don't do that out of love for them. Where we are around those who are themselves 
seeking to live by a certain biblical or moral code, even if we believe they could be free from this code in Christ, that their understanding is inaccurate or even legalistic, it should be our disposition to not indulge blatantly in those things that others would consider sinful. Now, as we do these things, as we defend the grace of God and how we read our Bible and how we relate to God and how we relate to godliness and how we relate to others, I think we can anticipate the same result that they experienced in Antioch when it says that they were greatly encouraged. And we should be greatly encouraged by the grace of God. The grace of God that is not licentiousness. It is not paganism. It is not the freedom to love and worship other things besides God. It is the freedom from believing that my works distance me from God and that I cannot approach him because of my failures or that I can't approach him because of my efforts. So when I read that verse, chapter, out of, out of Jerry Bridges' book, and when I read passages like this in Scripture that it's based on, I'm told you can approach God You nice old church kid, you can approach God, and it is not based at all on you being better than your neighbor or your brother. And that's good news, because one of these days, you're not going to be. And if you build up this expectation that you're approaching God because you had a better week, when you have a bad week, you won't. So on your good week, denounce that righteousness as leading you to standing before God, and on a bad week, declare that your righteousness is given by another. By the grace of God, we can experience the same rejoicing, the same encouragement that they experienced in Antioch and all those other church plants when they heard the good news. The grace of God, unearned, undeserved, given to us through the life and death of Jesus Christ, credited to our account such that we can rejoice in the good news of our salvation and not submit to the lie of legalism and celebrate that this good news has come to us, has come all the way to us 2,000 years later. This gospel of grace is what we were singing about, it's what we're thinking about, and it's what should shape our week this week. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we exult and rejoice in the grace of God. We exult in your grace. Lord, the grace that sent you, the grace that gave its life for us, the grace that positions us in right standing with you through no merit of our own. Lord, give us grace to reject the lie of legalism, the inner legalists, cultural expressions of legalism. Help us to stand for grace in our relationships and our, especially our relationship with you. We love your grace, Lord. Help our words to be full of your grace, speaking your grace to one another, celebrating it, Lord, defending it, rejoicing in it, worshiping you for it. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We're grateful to you.